my approach changed because I, I, I no longer took for granted the health of the land. Um, I, I could see that management of livestock uh, could improve the land. It could also um, do damage if it weren't done well. Flipping the table. When thinking of those who ranch, most of us outside that world may think of a culture and or a business that is not contemporary. A throwback to another time, a business and world that is linked to the late 19th century. Well, some of that's true, but ranching has evolved like all of agriculture. ATVs replace horses in many places. Ear tags track the lives of individual animals. Cattle trucks have replaced cattle drives and the vast majority of animals, perhaps 98%, finish their lives eating grain and other supplements in confined or concentrated animal feeding operations known as CAFOs. The independent, self-reliant character, though, is still very much alive in the ranching community. And that is especially evident in my guests today. Joe and Julie Morris are the owners and operators of Morris Grassfed. As the name implies, they are producers of grass-fed beef, which, as frequent listeners will know, is a passion of mine. By grass-fed, I mean grass-finished. I make this distinction because all cattle are grass-fed for most of their lives. Cows, like all ruminants, think goat, sheep, and deer, have evolved a system for turning woody, fibrous material into a nutritious food. They do this through the rumen, an organ that provides an environment for bacteria to ferment plant materials and unleash the nutrients that animals need to thrive. It is a fabulous evolutionary development, and it led to food sources for humans from the planet's grasslands, which are the most extensive landscape on Earth. It is important to note that today, still, 800 million people on the planet depend on grassland-based animals to survive. Like Julie, Joe grew up in the city, but because of his grandfather's ranch, he fell in love with grasslands and working cattle. Joe has a fascinating educational background that indicates to me why he's a holistic thinker. He graduated from the Great Books Program at Notre Dame, and then attended the UC Berkeley Graduate Theological Union. He worked on ranches in Venezuela and the state of Nevada for a few years before coming back and pursuing a business career. It was at this time that he met Julie, who had studied journalism and Italian at San Diego State. Today, Julie is the more outward-facing representative of Morris Grassfed, handling marketing, sales, and communication well, Joe oversees their ranching operations on several properties in Northern California. I would bet it was their eclectic and broad backgrounds that allowed them to approach the cattle business with new, innovative eyes. They embraced holistic management early on and the idea that soil health is the key to ranch and animal health. It is also why they came to see that direct relationships with those who buy their meat provides a better business model than selling into the commodity market, where it is always a race to the lowest price per pound. I find Joe and Julie and their business inspiring examples of what lay ahead if we are to achieve a resilient regional meat system that is good for people, the planet, and the animals that give their lives in order to feed us. Welcome to Joe and Julie Morris from Morris Grassfed Beef. Really glad to have you join me today in this conversation about your world. So, uh, how are you? We're doing well. Thanks for having us, Michael. Yeah, we're doing well. Good to talk to you, Michael. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So, uh, yeah, just so folks know, you're you're a married couple, and um, and uh, therefore you might have had different pathways into the ranching world. So, I would love to hear how you both came to ranching cattle. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, we, um, I 
my family's been in the cattle business in California since um, just after the gold rush. Uh, my great great grandfather was a butcher in San Francisco, and from there he partnered with um, some people to uh, to buy ranches and manage them. And he ended up as a partner on uh, uh, the, the Santa Margarita Ranch in Southern California, which is part of which is now uh, Camp Pendleton. And, um, so it's been in my family, it's been in my blood. And, uh, as I have been told, I was born with my boots on. So <laughs> it, it came to me very naturally. That's fabulous. So how and about, yeah, Julie. I grew up on 16th Avenue between Vicente and Yaloa in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> So wow. about as far from a ranch as you could be. Um, but I met Joe when I was a senior in college. And um, after spending a couple of years in Washington, D.C., decided to move back to California and take up ranching with him. Wow. What were you doing in D.C.? I worked for Thompson Reuters News Service oh, okay. covering Capitol Hill. Wow, how interesting. Nice, interesting. Yeah, it was and a fun what, a fun first out of college job. Yeah, I'll bet. And and what a nice combination as the communicator and the rancher. You guys that's why you've built a business probably. It helped. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a good combo. So so Joe, your family goes way back Santa Margarita Ranch. I I <clears throat> remember hearing about that ranch as I've mentioned uh, in other shows. Um members of my family are in the cattle business and obviously that ranch has, you know, it's, it's it, a part of the history of the state's cattle world. And yeah. so, um, you know, and you, so obviously you probably inherited a lot of thinking about ranching. So I, I'm very curious about, um, the evolution or the change in your approach to ranching over time. Why don't you tell us that journey? Well, my, my grandfather is, is um, was my first contact with ranching and he was uh he was a great cowboy a california cowboy a vaquero uh which is to say that um he did cowboy work with a lot of uh, grace and, and and skill and uh and it was really beautiful and i i really loved that the way we worked the horses and cattle and and um and and he had a great land ethic uh he was very instrumental in california cattlemen association in building and supporting the ranching community. Um, and, um, so I, I fell in love with the land and the cattle and the horses and the people very early on as a little boy. And then when I graduated from college, I, uh, I went to work on big ranches in Nevada and, you know, so my original approach was, was more about you know, the cows and the cowboys and the, and the horses. Um, and I thought it was beautiful and I, I thought they went together, but it wasn't until 1991 after I had, you know, left ranching for, um, to do a number of other things because I couldn't quite see how it fit into my bigger picture. Um, but I came back to ranching in 1991, like Julie, uh, we got married and I had discovered, um, uh, the work of Alan Savory, um, who, who kind of elucidated the idea that these animals and the land go together. And when managed as sort of members of the same community, uh, both can thrive really well. And, and so that, that my approach changed because I, I, I no longer took for granted the health of the land. Um, I, I could see that management of livestock uh, could improve the land. It could also um, do damage if it weren't done well and holistically. And so I've been on that, along with Julie, on that, uh, you know, on that learning curve for the last 30 years, uh, trying to understand uh, Alan's ideas and other uh, great management ideas, um, how to apply them in our particular context in in, ra in rangeland in California, and um, uh, so it's it's been a long long learning um, experience. It's been wonderful, and I've learned a lot, and 
shared our mistakes and our successes as well as I could and as openly as I could with our neighbors. Uh-huh. So, uh-huh. yeah. And, uh, still learning. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a that's a positive thing, huh? Still, I think we all are. Hopefully, we all are. Um, that's right. Yeah, uh, and um, so that. So, why don't you describe? Maybe Julie, you can describe where where is the ranch, and what is the what is the countryside um, the the land like where you live? So, the majority of the ranches that we manage, we lease. Um, we do live on Joe's family ranch which is relatively small when you think of cattle ranches, but our home ranch here is in San Juan Bautista. It's classic California uh, landscape with rolling golden hills in the summer and oak trees. We lease um, a couple of other ranches where we run the majority of our cattle. One is a state park, Hollister Hills State Park Mm -hmm. in Hollister. Mm -hmm. Another is the Kelly Thompson Ranch on Highway 129 in Watsonville. Mm -hmm. They grow produce, strawberries, lettuce on the flat grounds, and we lease the hills above the the farming ground. And then we lease um, a couple of other smaller ranches in the area. Um, Unfortunately, none of them are connected. So that's the nature of ranching in central California. I think we are competing with residential and commercial development and we, we take the range land that we can get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so why don't you to describe uh, whoever wants to describe the business? I mean, uh, it sounds like Alan Savory's um, kind of methodologies and thoughts about, about animals and nature impacted you, but what, what sparked the idea? Okay. I love this idea. or We love this idea. Now we're going to start a business. And when you started it, is it the same as it is today or how did it evolve? Yeah. Well, um, you know, Alan's great idea. I mean, he had some amazing observations, um, about the ecology of rangelands and livestock and, or animals. And, and, and plants and, and soils and so forth. But, you know, his, his great idea that not too many talk about was, was that the idea is that nature functions in whole and, and we people um, and other organic life are, are, are members of whole communities within larger communities. And our, our business is, is the same. It sort of emerged um, from our work on the land um, that's sort of its basis. We we manage animals and plants to try to enhance the the uh, the amount of, of sunlight that we capture through photosynthesis and move into plants and animals, soils, and and um, and then we we decided well we can we can do great things with as long as the animals are on the land, um, and as soon as the animals go off the land, they you know, into a feedlot, for example, they have, they lose their capacity to, to, um, to heal and to benefit the land itself. Mm -hmm. So we tried to figure out ways that we could, um, keep the animals as long as possible. And, um, when I was growing up, we ate beef that was raised by my grandfather. It was grass fed. No one talked about it that way, but that's just what it was. And it was always wonderful beef. So Julie and I decided, well, why don't we try to, um, you know, raise animals to the point of finishing and then try to sell them to our friends and neighbors and family and so forth. So that's kind of where we started uh, way back when, in probably 94, um, we started selling beef to our, our neighbors. And there was, there was this, uh, you know, burgeoning industry in the United States Um of ranchers who were interested in selling direct to, um, to, to consumers. And yeah. I think our model is unique because from the get go, we focus on selling a quarter cow as the smallest portion. A quarter cow. Also known as a, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Quarter yeah, cow. also known as a split half, which <laughs> means that the butcher takes cuts from the front and the hind quarter so that the steaks are evenly distributed 
Um, but essentially it equals a quarter cow. And how many and pounds is that not, so people will get that? Yeah, it's about between 85 and 90 pounds. Mm-hmm. And uh, our customers have freezers. Mm-hmm. They budget to purchase their beef in bulk. Mm-hmm. And we deliver it once a year. They stock up. And that's sort of the, the model that we have always followed. We've, we've shied away from restaurants and retail outlets and selling individual cuts. Because when we ran the numbers, we just realized that those were the least profitable endeavors. So we really wanted to focus our energy on the products that actually have a good return. You know, we, we, uh, we both grew up in the city. So a lot of our friends are, are urban people. And it was, it's very clear to us that there is this, um, this large gap between you know, what happens in rural communities and on the land itself and um, the people who buy most of the food. And that always was a concern of ours because very little good comes of it. If people are, you know, sort of divorced from the processes that their lives depend upon, um, they really can't, their capacity to make good decisions about what affects those processes and the people who work on the land, um, their capacity goes down. So we wanted through our business and our own lives to connect people as intimately as we could um, with the, the, you know, the beauty that surrounds our life on a daily basis and the, and the action and the wonderful, amazing processes whereby sunlight and carbon and water you know, combine in myriad ways to become delicious beef and biodiversity and flowers and grass and, and, uh, and our communities and the ideas and everything is based on those things. And our business was designed to, to keep those connections with people who are eating the food we're growing as, as intimate as possible. And, um, and that's kind of, that's where we still are. Um, yeah, so yeah. That, I, I can see uh, uh, one of you said earlier that your business is unique to you, and it's true. I mean, the the advantage of, of, in a sense, for Joe moving back to the land from the city and uh, Julie being a, a person of the city, you had you have the relationships that you can bring back. One of the challenges for rural people is that they're often cut off from that, the markets, um, but you were not. And so that'll, that sounds like it was a leverage point for you all to, to actually de- develop your customer base. I think it was. And we also have the advantage of being located close to urban areas. I mean, we are 90 miles south of San Francisco, 40 miles south of the Silicon Valley, mm-hmm. 30 miles east of the Monterey Bay. Mm-hmm. So we have these large urban areas nearby filled with people who have disposable income and care about food and are educated about nutrition and how their food is produced. So we we have that advantage that we have markets Mm -hmm. in close proximity. Mm -hmm. And do you have, um, are you at a place where you don't need to grow your market anymore? Are you all always still, still trying to grow your market? You're, you're the number of consumers that are purchasing from you directly. I think we're always trying to grow our market just because there are customers who drop off as well. So you need to fill in those people who become empty nesters and decide mm-hmm. they don't need a quarter cow anymore or, um, you know, have a lifestyle change and, and, their doctor tells them to eat less red meat or something. So I would never want to say that we've stopped growing our business. However, I do think that we are sort of of the thought that when you reach a certain level where it's comfortable, you don't always have to get bigger. There is, there is a sweet spot where um, you are at a healthy point and you don't necessarily need to get bigger. Mm-hmm. We'd rather focus on quality mm-hmm. over quantity. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. I mean, uh, yeah. I, go ahead, Joe. Well, I was, I was just kind of just going to reiterate. I, we're we're not committed to growing um, 
there's a lot of really good uh, grass-fed beef companies in, in California who are uh, probably more sophisticated marketers than, than we are. But, w- w- you know, it's <laughs> as far as we're concerned, our work on the land is primary and connecting the customers, as we've said before, as closely as possible, you know, with with us and with um, with the land itself is just of primary importance. And, you know, you, you, you can't, we don't feel, we don't know that you can grow, you know, with, without, without losing some of those, um, uh, the quality of that relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've, uh, through the slow money movement and other kind of in, uh, investor groups that have been focused on sustainable food systems and regenerative agriculture, I've heard many stories over the years about, um, the danger of scaling too large and the loss of, of uh, connection to the founding principles and, and values that might launch a company. And mm-hmm. it sounds like you're really keyed on staying with it. And, I, and I'll just say, reflect back to you that, you know, in a way you're, you're, you're describing um, what I would say is an idyllic example of of the kinds of food businesses that need to surround the urban centers so that that relationship between eaters and producers is intimate, alive, energized, and there's a flow back and forth of not just food and money, but also ideas and experience and, uh, and shared experience uh, uh, and, and a shared sense of what's valuable in the world. I mean, particularly right now, where we're so polarized as a nation, it seems like a, one of the antidotes is the kind of relationship you're providing. What would you say about that? I think you're absolutely right. Relationship building is as important to us as producing good food. Um, when people call our office, either Joe or I pick up the phone or the machine, but Joe or I call you back. Mm-hmm. Um, I answer every single email that customers send to me. It may take me a day or two, but we really value that first person relationship with our customers. And I think our customers value that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been known to text back customers at 9.30 PM on a Sunday night, <laughs> you know, if, if they have a question. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's part of the value add of local food and knowing, knowing your producer. Mm-hmm. And it goes both ways. You know, we, we deliver beef, we rent a freezer truck and we, you know, kind of design a route to go through the Bay area or the Monterey Bay area and, and central coast and deliver beef directly to people. We meet them in parks and, you know, um, you know, all over the place, parking lots or whatever. So that's not always the most interesting place to meet, but it's very gratifying to, you know, to see face to face once a year, try to remember their name, you mm-hmm. know, uh, and get a pat on the back. Often they, they express gratitude for, you know, what, what we're doing. And, um, and, and, you know, so our relationship persists and it's, it's great. And I think, I, and I think from their standpoint too, you know, their human, human communities are, 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 you know, held together by stories. And, um, the stories of themselves and their connections and their relationships. And, you know, when, when our, when, when some of our customers who've been customers for 10, even 20, 25 years, you know, their families have grown up, they visited the ranch, they've been meeting us in a parking lot for 20 years. And, uh, uh, they, they have, they have a sense of where the beef comes from. They've often seen the place and the story they're telling themselves when they're eating, a Morris grass fed burger is a story that just um, excites them and, and enriches their life. And, and they, they can participate in the joy of what we do. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, that's really gratifying. Mm-hmm. Well, before we move on from this, uh, this piece of the conversation around the business, I, I have another question. So, so I have actually two little questions. One is what is the footprint that you reach to? How <coughs> far do you deliver to? Well, we we have uh, customers um, as far north. Well, it, 
we we in 19 i can't remember when it was it was like 2001 or two um there was mad cow disease was discovered in some cattle um coming across the border uh in in northern in the united states and um all the rules changed about processing um in a few short months and so we had to redesign our whole processing um arrangements and find new processors that were all USDA inspected and so forth. And so we found one up in Northern California, Johansson, uh, and they've been wonderful partners of ours. Um, and that sort of pushed us in this way of delivering the beef actually to customers along the way from picking it up at the butcher in a refrigerated, you know, truck and then designing a route to meet customers on the way home. So we meet people, as far north as Williams and Sacramento, mm-hmm. um, all the way, and we used to go to Los Angeles. Um, we we don't at this point, but we do. Julie just and she'll tell you about it. Just started a shipping direct shipping program, so we we cover the whole state basically. Um, um, our split halves are, you know, from Sacramento to to LA. This is Michael. I just wanted to say how thrilled I am and excited that you're listening to Flipping the Table. These are the kinds of conversations I've wanted to share with people for a decade or more. So please like us, share with your friends, write a review, and subscribe. And then the second question is, you mentioned the, this idea of split halves, a quarter of a beef. Does, has anyone ever gone from a split half to a whole half because they just loved it and they, they have a big clan or they like to serve lots of beef? You know, I bet you 20% of our customers order halves. Wow, that's or awesome. Whole. We have some customers who order a whole cow. Yeah, they And probably... they share it with other families or they have, you know, four teenage football players in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably, you know. Three or four percent order holes, mm-hmm. at least twenty percent order halves, mm-hmm. and the balance orders um, split halves. Mm-hmm. Do you um, have, so, so that's interesting. So, I, you know, I'm on a keto diet because uh, carbohydrates are not good for me, and I, so I really have gotten off carbohydrates, and it's really helped me. I've lost thirty pounds. I feel great. Uh, my blood cool. work's fantastic. Um, and one of the things I'm always looking for is 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 beef that has some fat on it because if you're on a keto diet, you got to eat a lot of fat. That's what your body's burning instead of carbs. So I'm curious, yep. do you ever get people saying, "Look, at I really want a fat, <laughs> I want a fat steer, I want a fat cow"? Can you provide our that? beef? Our beef does have fat. It's mm-hmm. it's as fatty as conventional beef, but it's the good kind of fat. Yeah, it's great, and it's delicious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah that, every once in a while, every once in a while, we'll get an animal or a, a customer who says it's it's too fatty. Um, wow. but not very often Our, you know, it, our, our animals would, you know, if they were graded, they would grade kind of high select, probably, um, mm-hmm. low choice, mm-hmm. maybe that's sort of our target. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, um, yeah, so there's plenty of fat and it's fantastic. I love fat, um, pretty much all kinds. It comes from animal fat and it's, uh, and our beef is not super lean. That, that that really wouldn't be good beef. So yeah, I was going to say, and you can always saute it in butter, Michael. <laughs> right, exactly. Right, or put blue cheese on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, I I'm always struck when people are like, "Oh man, I want lean beef." I'm like, "Why?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, right, right. Yeah. So they drank the Kool Aid. Yeah, the wrong yeah. Kool-Aid. I know. There's so much bad information now, but anyway. So. Um, Let's talk about fires and COVID because, you know, I, I live in Sonoma County and as before we started recording, I was just updating you on what it's been like up here. And this is, I've had to, in the last four years, I've had to evacuate twice and live through four unbelievable fire seasons of smoke. We know the whole state is is struggling right now. The, the biggest fires in California history this year, it looks like are going to happen so far. That is the fires are the biggest in history so far. Um, it's burning down your way uh, 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 in the mountains. And um, it's, uh, I mean, I, I drove back from Humboldt County on um, Monday and the amount of smoke up coming through Mendocino County, it was like, it was like cutting through fog. It's unbelievable how bad it is. Yeah. So, it's 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 terrifying in one sense, but compelling in another way. That's you know. So I'm curious about what you think about fire, your experience with fire, and then also the impact of COVID on your business. Okay, well let's uh, we'll go to fires first. Um, yeah, fires have been burning down here 
um, on both sides of us, you know, probably within 30 miles of each, either way, there's been big fires down here. We've been very fortunate this year. Um, and none of the lightning strikes, uh, two weeks ago, you know, struck our, our ranches. So knock on wood, we're, we're only about halfway through the fire season. So, yeah. you know, we're still sort of on pins and needles. Um, we, uh, we do, some of our neighbors have been very seriously affected, but we've, we've been lucky so far. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we haven't had a fire over the years, we try to, you know, we design with our grazing planning. Um, areas where we can uh, reduce the grass to the level where fires just really wouldn't do much, mm-hmm. and um, and we do that by design with, through our grazing planning with our animals in in the late spring of the year. Um, and we we also do in a state park, for example, they 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 neighbor um, kind of a housing complex, and uh, we do that for them every year. We mm-hmm. You know, we graze, I don't know, 50 acres along that boundary or 100 acres, depending on um, where we go, uh, to try to, you know, design for that. And um, unfortunately, our communities are not well designed um, to make that happen. And in a lot of areas, uh, cattle grazing or other grazing, sheep, even goats, goats. has been removed. Mm -hmm from the landscape in California and that that has its own consequences in terms of, uh, you know, biodiversity loss, but, uh, the, the, the consequences get really pretty dramatic when the fire fuel loads and ladder fuels and all those things that animals happily eat and, and crunch. Um, when animals are removed, we're putting ourselves at risk. Um, and I know the cattle, California Cattlemen's Association is trying to kind of create a network where people with livestock and people with land that might be um, problematic because of fire can get together. I'm, I'm not sure how well it's worked so far, but I think that is uh, that's a direction we really need to go. Yeah, let, let me just say that uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, they brought a bunch of goats in to just north of Healdsburg to work along the edges of Highway 101 uh, where people throw cigarettes and light fires. And it's it's a really good thing. And, and it does seem to me, and I'm, so this is a question, um, don't you think that there's real possibilities in the future for a lot more cattle to be, cattle or hooved animals to be uh, produced in this state by, uh, through fire management um, uh, contracts? Yeah, I think there are. I, I don't know. You know, cattle can do a lot of things that, that goats and, and sheep do too. But because, the, you know, sheep and goats are pretty light on infrastructure and cattle are much bigger. So, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the application is slightly different. Um, and, uh, I you know, I, I have a friend who's a retired professor at Cal Poly, and he says the state needs 100 million sheep. Um you know, and, and I don't know if his numbers are quite that correct, but I think I think it's in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it's not only because, you know, fires are burning because, um, you know, there's a lot of fuel. There's a lot of grass and trees and shrubs and brush and all kinds of things that uh, historically weren't necessarily there or not as dense. Um, and we've built into these areas. But the grazing can actually produce um, you know, a, a cooler climate, Mm -hmm. um, if, if it's done well Mm -hmm. and it ought to be done well, there's no reason it it can't be done well, but I think we're, we kind of short circuit the conversation. If we just are talking about managing against fire, we should really be managing for biodiversity, uh, healthy water cycles, effective, you know, infiltration of water and, uh, and soil and, health and soil health and mm. those kinds of things. Carbon capture. Um, yeah. Yeah, carbon capture. And 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 you know, the effects of that are good food, beauty, um, a more a more um uh congenial climate, um, you know, probably better neighbor relations, <laughs> you know, yeah. all all of the above, better health, human health. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. so I you know, I'm optimistic about where we can go. Um a lot of the things that prevent us from going in that direction are, are social. And, you know, it's like the, 
the Kool-Aid about fat is bad. Well, right. that's bad information. And yet it's, uh, it's, a, it's a conviction mm-hmm. that's held too broadly. Mm-hmm. So, Julie, quickly, uh, what, has COVID impacted you? And if so, how? Well, on the bright side, I think COVID has prompted a resurgence in local food, or at least an interest in local food. When people realized that there may be meat shortages in the grocery store, our phone, as did phones of all the other ranchers we know, was ringing off the hook. Mm. Suddenly, people wanted to buy their meat from a local source, which is great news. And we hope that that's something that's going to stick beyond COVID. Now, there's a flip side to that, which is processing. Um, And that has been a bottleneck because we don't have enough small-scale butchers to take animals directly from ranches and package them for retail sale. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole nother show topic, which I'm sure you know. Um, We're going to talk about it on Friday. (laughs) Right, we are. Um, But, you know, I do think that it's raised awareness of how food is produced, where it's produced. And hopefully people will be more conscientious of, of their food choices um, now that they've sort of been forced to think about it. We, we do run a little agritourism business on the ranch, too, where people come and stay. That, that's been a little bit negatively affected by um, the fires, the smoke. A couple of people have canceled. Um, but again, COVID has also sort of forced people to stay closer to home. So we've Mm -hmm. seen people come to stay at our little glamping site for longer than one night. They're staying for two and three nights this summer, which is, which has been good. So, you know, as tragic as COVID is, um, I think it's, it's provided some opportunities for people to think about things differently. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good news. And, you know, along the lines of processing, there's a lot of processing challenge. I mean, there's not enough processing, as we know, not enough slaughter facilities, not enough cut and wrap facilities, the, the issues mm-hmm. that you, you face. Um, there's also, I mean, we just saw last week, Foster Farms, the big poultry plant shut down, eight workers died. Um, it turns out the company wasn't, may not have been listening to the public health department's warnings about what they needed to do. And now the plant shut down. And so the workers are hurt, the, the business is hurt, and, and the the community economy is hurt down there in Merced, which is a tragedy. And I, I heard you, you may remember Catherine Kwanbeck. She um, worked in Mendocino County and did the study about a, a, a mobile slaughter facility to be utilized up there many years ago. And now she lives in Oregon, works for a grass fed beef company up there. And she was telling me that they have a plant. They put 2,000 animals through it a year, I think she said. And she said that not one person in that small a uh, plant that serves grass fed and other local operators did not have one person that got COVID because they have space and it's, it's smaller. And, and that was the kind of thing that I, you know, gives me hope about uh, if we rethink the, how we do meat processing in the state of California, it might be much better for workers too. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're right. And our, our experience with our processors is exactly that too. I mean, they, there's been no, um, you know, people are wearing masks. They're doing what they need to do. You know, they're following the CDC guidelines and, and that's, so they haven't had any sickness and that's really good. I mean, one thing that's kind of been kind of an interesting effect is that, that one of our processors, um, they have had some labor problems because, um, you know, the, the, of the, uh, the unemployment, um, situation and and uh it became actually more more profitable for some workers to stay home i don't, I don't think that's long term going to be very satisfying to people but short term mm-hmm. they were getting paid more to stay home mm-hmm. through the unemployment uh, the care the cares act i think mm-hmm. than they were paid at work and that, mm-hmm. you know so that i mean you could see you could look at it two ways and i've heard it two ways you know one is like oh the workers are lazy and they should be at work and the other thing is, well, maybe our wage scale is out of whack, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so um, it's, there, it's exposed a lot of, you know, weaknesses in our in our system, mm-hmm. and um, those that always offers opportunities to improve. So that's right. Well, yeah. um, I'm just curious. Uh, we're going to move to 
we'll kind of talk about the industry in a minute. But before we do that, I just want to talk to you about, because you mentioned uh, when you were talking about the benefits, you talked about water infiltration and water cycles and, and what what uh, good ranching practices can mean for that. So we had the drought uh, many, you know, seems like a few years ago now, but it lasted a long time and boy, it impacted a lot of people I know in the ranching business. So I'm curious, you know, how did you guys weather the drought? Uh, it was excruciating. Uh, the longer it went on, the more excruciating it was. And we ended up, we ended up having to sell our, our, um, our herd of cows. Um, Mm. and so, and that was difficult. Um, but the you know I guess the good news is, is that we we learned that um, there was a community out there that was uh, you know able and willing to help us think through next steps. What do we do? Because you know if if there's no grass, what do we do? How do we run a business? Where do we where where might we find grass? You know what are our resource resources? And um, and so you know. Since then, and even before, you know, our, our philosophy is we are managing the animals in such a way that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the ecosystem improves. And so we're hoping that over time, um, you know, we can create a little more resilience on our ranch ranches, uh, to the effects of drought. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're learning all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, that'll be interesting to watch. That'll be very interesting to watch over the next, you know, if we have another one. And uh, last year was dry. And if this year's dry, we may be back into it. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not if, it's it's when we will, we will have another one. And, and um, so we just have to manage for, you know, for, to retain and to more water in the system. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, no, we've kind of touched on what the, what the hurdles are. I mean, we've got obviously, major challenges around providing enough slaughter and, and processing facilities for ranchers and ranch operations like yours to get their product to market. Um, we've talked about drought. We've talked about fire. We've talked about COVID. I mean, these are the kinds of hurdles. Are there any other, you know, large hurdles that you would want consumers to hear about, the public to hear about, that that, that they might be able to help resolve by taking action or making their voices heard? Well, I think people should be um, cautious about the promises of plant-based meat. Mm -hmm. I think that there are costs to that that um, those companies do not do not readily um, admit to. And I think if if people are um, concerned about how their food is produced and its impact on the environment. A little bit of research would be would be helpful to see the difference between real meat and fake meat. Mm-hmm. I think that's one one threat we see ahead is that the messaging around um, plant based foods may not be uh, may not be as as transparent mm-hmm. as it should. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think time will tell. I have seen when it first began to get the buzz it seemed like it was all one way i do see other folks now trying to make the argument that whoa you know let's look more deeply at this there's there are like you said there are costs so given that um and all the other things you know, are you too optimistic about the the particularly the grass-fed sector of the meat economy i mean do you see it growing i mean what's your idea of its of its pace of growth is it going to become dominant in time what do you think Oh, where's my crystal ball? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm I'm optimistic. I mean, it, it, it's you know we've we've been in this uh, almost thirty years um, as direct marketing of grass finished beef, and uh, there doesn't seem to be any let up in demand. It it's uh, you know and the, the you know the bigger bigger players they're doing what they always do. They, you know, they write rules and then they write rules to give themselves an advantage. And and it's all, you know, kind of distorted about what, you know, what the issues are. I think the fact that the bigger players have gotten in on the grass fed beef tells you that it is here to stay. Mm -hmm. They're nervous about it being, you know, the little, 
nippy dog at the heel. Um, mm-hmm. And if you compare it to the organic movement, it's done nothing but grow. Mm-hmm. And um, I think year over year, more people are interested in how and where their food is produced. And grass fed answers those questions. So yes, I am optimistic. I think it's um, been been a great ride for the past thirty years, and that tells me that it it isn't just a trend or a blip. We've seen consistent growth over several decades. The challenge is going to be, you know, I mean, for a lot of um, companies, they get to, you know, we can get to a certain level. And uh, it seems that that is being consistently, that level is consistently arrived at, you know, across the country, but it's not very big. And then there's a big hurdle to get to, um, you know, to, to grow a company to a, the next level, mm-hmm. not even as big as, you know, the, the, the gargantuan companies, but how do you, you know, we, we, we find that it's challenging to, um, you know, the, to get to get processing in a way that's inexpensive enough to make our product competitive with, um, you know, conventional commodity commodity products. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the cost of the cost is really high. Mm-hmm. It, it seems promising to me that uh, you know the latest. Um, interest um, because of because of COVID, people are staying home. They're learning to cook. They're trying to take interest in in their food, where it comes from, the quality of it. You know, all of those things seem to be more important today than they were six months ago. And that's that's a good that's a good sign um, because it's going to align, I think, you know, the interests of of urban people with the interests of 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 producers rural people. Um, and, and some of that processing, you know, may, may be addressed. And, mm-hmm. and if it is, uh, I'm really, I'm really hopeful because there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of capacity to, um, you know, to produce grass, good grass finished products. So, um, how do listeners reach you if they'd like to learn more or, or, or your products? What, what's the best way to get a hold of you two? You can go to our website at morrisgrassfed.com and that will give you a link to order to learn more about what we do, to learn about our work on the land and events like field days, our, our echo glamping site, um, all sorts of good information. And there's a press section too if you want to read about what we were doing in 1992. <laughs> we, we can we can track the history. Yeah. Wow. That's good. Well, um, it has been a, a joy to talk to you. And, uh, you know, I've uh, we've known each other for a long time. I think it started with the slow food movement. But um, yeah. I have watched uh, your business over the years and seen you present at conferences uh, around regenerative ranching and farming and, um, you know, at different, different meetings, <laughs> Julie, that we all have to go to. So... Um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to have had this time with you. Thank you very much and best of luck. Thank you, Michael. You, you keep up the great work as well. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a million, Michael. Good to talk to you. Yeah. Take care. Hey, this is Michael. As you know, Flipping the Table is sponsored by Roots of Change. You can keep our program going by making a contribution to Roots of Change through our website, rootsofchange.org. 